This is House Planning Help, episode 272. Hello, I'm Ben Adam-Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self-build or retrofit. I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. Coming up in this session, my guest is Emily Penn, ocean advocate and co-founder of X Expedition. We're going to be looking at the material plastic, which I was thinking actually is something that we've done in connection to windows before, looking at PVC windows, whether they're a good choice. But of course, a building site goes way beyond that in terms of the plastic that we use. So in today's episode, we're keeping a fairly wide spectrum here, just talking about plastic in general, and then we'll relate it to homes towards the end. I must do a quick hat tip to the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. They host the Healthy Buildings Conference and Expo every year, and I'll put a link into the show notes in case you want to check out the lineup for this year. But it's a great conference, and Emily was the keynote speaker last year. So I've been chasing her, hoping that we can get her onto the podcast, and uh, I've made it happen for you today. So I think you're going to like this one. As I mentioned, it's going to start broad and also out at sea, as she is an oceans advocate but it does seem like a lot of the challenges that we face as a species are of our own making and here is yet another example plastic in many respects it's a wonder product but it does have a major flaw and we're going to discuss that i started though by asking emily to tell me a little bit about her background So I spend my time looking at plastic pollution in our world's ocean. Um, I've spent the last 10 years really researching these accumulation zones, what we call gyres, where the plastic ends up, um, through sailing expeditions and taking people uh, from all different backgrounds out to really see the problem. And it was through a talk that you gave that really started me on my plastic journey. So let's just go back to the beginning and get some stuff straight. So what is plastic? Plastic is really a material um, that's very useful in our daily lives. We touch it every day, hundreds of times, whether it's food packaging, which is great for um, increasing how long food actually lasts and uh, removes food waste. We use it a lot for hygiene, um, so in hospitals um, and also in our daily lives to keep things clean. We use it in buildings as well. It's proved to be a very useful uh, material for, for keeping water out. You know, it's, uh, it's waterproof. It's got lots of great properties and there's really good reasons why we use it. It's lightweight, it's easy to transport, it's cheap to make. But it also, it lasts forever. And we've started using it for different types of uses that are actually designed to be used once. And that's where we've run into this problem of having a huge amount of pollution in the world. So where does it come from, this plastic, to begin with? How is it made? Uh, So it comes from oil. Um, So oil that we take from the ground, um, it then gets turned into a polymer. And it gets turned into different types of polymers depending on the uses. Um, So PET uh, is what we make our bottles, um, like our uh, Coca-Cola or um, water bottles out of. Um, HDPE is what our cloudy milk bottles are made from. Um, And then we've got PVC. Uh, which of course windows and drain pipes and things like that and we then got low density polyethylene so that's things like plastic bags and polypropylene and that's a much more hard durable plastic polystyrene which you know we usually know in the expanded context it's very good uh, protective packaging or um, we also see it being used for uh, takeout containers Um, and then the final category number seven is really just a catch-all for everything else including these biodegradable plastics that we can talk about as well Um, so those are all the different types and so they're all made with slightly different chemical structures based on the different types of properties that they have Uh, then they also are made with a lot of additives and that gives them additional properties so something like a phthalate is added to plastic to make it particularly flexible or or stretchy which is a lovely property but unfortunately phthalates are these chemicals that can end up getting into our own bodies and and lead to problems there well i certainly want to talk about this in a minute but just going back to oil for a second so if oil is used as a fuel does that mean that this is a waste product or is this an alternative use of oil it's really an alternative use and there is some sort of interchangeness here so um you know we can actually use plastic waste as a fuel for example and turn it back into it but but really it's being made as a standalone plastics industry product all right and then how did you first find out about plastic or start on this journey 
So I actually did a degree in architecture and lined up my first job in Australia, but I wanted to get there without taking an aeroplane. And so I ended up hitching a ride on a boat from England, across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, towards Australia. Um, but along the way, really in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, I started to see plastic. Uh, we would be a thousand miles from nearest land and seeing a toothbrush or a cigarette lighter or a bottle top just floating by. Wow. Why is that there or how is it? get there so a lot of it's due to the ocean currents because our planet's spinning creating the Coriolis effect we have these uh, big rotating currents in our oceans northern hemisphere they move clockwise southern hemisphere anti-clockwise but in the middle of these fast moving currents that are a few thousands of miles wide there is this calm patch and as um, meteorologists we would call it the center of the high but as scientists looking at plastic that's what we call a gyre but these plastics, are they dumped off ships? Have they somehow come from land and rivers and then into the seas? So the data shows that about 80% of the plastic in the ocean is coming from land and 20% coming from ships. So for ships, that would be fishing is really kind of the biggest contributor. Uh, so losing fishing line, um, losing polystyrene lids that go on the fish bins when they're trying to keep fish cold. But really it's the, the, the lines and the nets and all the different types of plastic things they use on a fish farm that end up there. But we also then find um, things that have fallen off shipping containers. Um, so it's surprising how many actually <laughs> fall off. To fall off? It's either the whole shipping container or or does the door open? How is it called? Yeah, well, I mean, they, they do get lost. They, they fall off. Um, and so there was this sort of interesting story around the rubber ducks where a whole container of rubber ducks were lost and they started showing up in literally every corner of the planet. And that's where scientists started to sort of learn about these ocean currents. There was an interesting one off Cornwall recently and it was a bunch of Lego that came off a container. Um, but the quite interesting thing was it was all pirate-themed Lego and it's been washing up on the beaches of Cornwall. <laughs> Slight coincidence there. So you'd think being out at sea that the plastics would just break down. So, well, I suppose that is happening, but maybe you can tell us about the, the end cycle of plastic. Yeah, so um, it is breaking down. And I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions. We expect there to be this island of plastic, something quite tangible, something we can go and easily clean up. Uh, but the reality is when we get out there, we find more like a soup of microplastics. So the UV rays from the sun, the wind and the waves all work at breaking down those bigger bits of plastic into these small fragments that we call microplastics. So that really determines anything that's under five millimeters or smaller than your little fingernail, I like to say. And do those still sit on top of the sea or can they just get anywhere? A bit of both. It depends on the type of plastic. So on the surface of the ocean, we find a lot of HDPE, which was that number two, the cloudy uh, milk bottle that I mentioned, because it's less dense than um, salt water. Other types of plastic, though, PET and polystyrene, when it's no longer in its expanded form with uh, air bubbles in between, is actually more likely to sink in the marine environment, especially when it's got biofoul on it. So when the algae and the barnacles start to grow, it then causes it to sink as well. Um, so we're only just starting to understand really how much is on the top versus the bottom. But some of the statistics show We've got 8 million tonnes of plastic that leaves land going into our ocean each year. And that's what's making up that 80% that I mentioned of the amount of plastic, making its way down streams, drains, rivers and waterways um, leading into the ocean. 8 million tonnes going in, but we can only account for a quarter of a million on the surface. So that suggests the missing plastic, it... It might be getting eaten. It might be so small that it's going through our nets, but most likely the majority of it's sinking um, into a place so deep that we don't really know what's going on down there. So this plastic it is pollution, but does it do anything more than that than just sit in the water? So we are starting to see the way it impacts the food chain. It's very easy for fish, 
seabirds, marine mammals to mistake that plastic for food. They end up eating it and then they die of starvation because they've got so much plastic inside their stomach. They can't get any good nutrients inside and there's no way of them getting it out. Just a a couple of months ago, I was in Hawaii doing a, a dissection of a sea turtle and we found 78 pieces of plastic in one stomach and and gut basically of a sea turtle and so just to give you an example of of how much it's really impacting the marine life and the same with birds particularly the albatross and then fish so many of the fish we catch have it too so it impacts them through entanglement through starvation but another potential impact that is still very under researched is whether there's any human impact as well But before we go to human impact, I mean, presumably it's not just a case of it sitting in its stomach. It could affect them in some other way. I'm just guessing here, but... Yeah, so, and and again, this, and I guess that's the the bit as well that's been more researched in humans, but trying to understand about plastic and the chemicals associated with plastic. So the phthalates that I mentioned earlier, there's also chemicals like fluorinated compounds that make a plastic waterproof, like the wet weather gear that we (laughs) wear when we're sailing, or a camping kit. Um, There's other chemicals, brominated compounds, that make things fire resistant. All really useful chemicals but when they end up as a pollutant in the marine environment which so many of these chemicals eventually do because they get washed down our washing machines or down the drain or eventually make their way into the ocean then they're a pollutant that can get into back into organisms Um, and the impact that they have some of them are carcinogens that lead to cancer and others are endocrine disruptors so they mimic hormones and they prevent those hormones, important chemical messages going from our brain to different parts of our body, they prevent them actually moving around our body. Um, So particularly for women during pregnancy, having hormones carry those messages while we're growing a child inside us uh, is really, really vital. And the other thing I realised is that the only way we actually get rid of these chemicals is when we give birth and when we breastfeed, we can actually pass them on to our children. Yeah, it's it's scary. Uh, the actual plastic, there's no good way of getting rid of it, though, is there? Not when it's in the ocean. Because it's so small and it's the same size as the marine life, the algae, the zooplankton, that sort of fundamental basis of the marine food chain, it's so hard to extract one from another. And so trying to take out these five trillion fragments of microplastic that are floating on the surface of the ocean... But even on land, what, what's the, the solution? Uh, the solution is to look as far upstream as we possibly can to prevent plastic getting into the sea or And then land. things are good or what, it just sits in a controlled area? Because, you know, surely it can't really be contained. You don't know 100%. And that's it. When I started on this plastic journey over the, the last year since your talk, it was just realising, oh my goodness, this is everywhere. And some of the plastic we find in our bodies must be coming from the supermarkets, first of all, because that's where all, everything, all of our food's wrapped in plastic. Absolutely. So by getting to the source, I mean exactly that, actually getting away from plastic completely. Um, so down sort of, if you look at the source, um, the spectrum from source to ocean, down at the bottom, you're trying to clean it up. You're trying to control it. Then you're trying to prevent it getting in. But better still, um, the next stage is closing the loop. How can we, if we are using plastic, how can we make sure it gets recovered right at the point that it's finished its use so it can stay in a closed loop system? But better still than that is just avoiding it completely. So how can we switch to alternative products and really alternative systems that mean we can live life without plastic? You mean the systems that used to exist, what is it, 60 years ago? (laughs) Yeah, a a lot of it is looking back to how we used to do things. But also recognising that life's moved on. You know, we've had massive urbanisation. We've had massive progress in expectations and the way we live our lives. And so it needs to be a bit of a balance, looking back to how we used to do things, but also working out how we're going to manage to do that in the 21st century. So as someone that's been around this subject for a while, do you think outside the single-use plastic um, sector, is there still justified use for plastic uh, you know even if you wanted it around for 20 30 50 years maybe longer 
Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to um, picking the right material depending on the function that you want it to have. And the great thing about plastic is, is it's designed to last forever. So if you want something to last forever, um, then it you know it should be a, a good choice of material. Uh, but it's thinking about doing it in a way so that when it does come to the end of its life, if you are using something you think maybe will be around for 50 years, thinking, well, that plastic is still going to be there in 50 years' time and will have a lot more life left in it. So how can I build this in a way? Maybe you can take it apart at the end. It could be used for something else. And trying to avoid these sort of composite materials that we use a lot of today that are different types of plastic all stuck together in a way that you couldn't then use it again. So you mentioned closed loop. What do you mean by that? So the most obvious example of closed loop is uh, in Norway and Germany at the moment, they're doing bottle to bottle recycling. So 98% of their bottles are recycled in a closed loop system. To make that work, you have to artificially inflate the value of the plastic by putting a financial deposit on it that you pay when you buy it, which means there's much more incentive to bring it back in a good quality state by the, the person who's used it. And to do that, they have things like reverse vending machines. So instead of putting your money in and getting your chocolate out, uh, you put your bottle in and you get the money out. And they're in a lot of supermarkets now um, in Europe and potentially soon to be here in the UK. But we've talked about fragmenting of plastic. What's to say that as plastic is used, that it's not fragmenting, even if we can't see it? Absolutely. And that is definitely a concern. You know, when you're drinking from a water bottle, are you more likely to get plastic in your body from that water bottle than you would be if you were drinking it from a glass? And some of the initial research shows probably yes. So so that is certainly a, a kind of health question. And the fact that that plastic, there are small amounts of it breaking down, which is why the closed loop options are definitely worth exploring right now. But they're still not at the very top of that source to ocean spectrum, um, because avoiding plastic completely is ultimately uh, where we want to go, especially for that type of use of bottle to bottle. I think when it comes to things like building materials, though, um, we, we just need to think intelligently about what we're using and think, you know, if this is something that is going to be here for a very long time and it makes more sense to use plastic instead of some other material for whatever reason, assessing the, you know, the life cycle analysis really of those materials, then we need to think carefully about how could it then be reused. And, and we so often design for the primary function but we don't design for end of life and I think that's the ultimate message we just need to think about what happens at the end very good point are there good alternatives that just get shoved out the way because plastic is easier I think absolutely it's easier and it's cheaper and it's cheaper because we don't pay for the full cost of actually getting rid of the plastic at the end and turning it back into oil that raw material we just pay for the use of it without any consequence of the impact the financial impact it has on the environment as well so I think that's really something to keep in mind what about recycling then? So let's say we have our plastic and this is perhaps where I was a year or so back with that I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm being really good here. Everything's going in for recycling. How effective is that? So at the moment, globally, 9% of the plastic that we use actually gets recycled. And I was pretty shocked when I found out that number. I really thought it was higher. And I think when we're, you know, at home in our kitchen and we're unloading our shopping, we, you know, we feel like we're putting a lot in that recycling bin. But the reality is, um, because of all those different types that I mentioned earlier, only really types one and two, that PET and HDPE, get recycled here in the UK, other places around the world, not even that. And so it's bearing in mind that the yogurt pots and all the other things in your shopping aren't getting recycled at all. And then it's this sort of contamination piece. You know, if you have a toothbrush, which is obviously made of plastic as well, there's no way that can be recycled because it's got four different types of plastic all stuck together. So, so that's sort of one side of it. But the other side of it around recycling is that when you say the word recycling, you have this image in your mind of three arrows going round in a circle and it makes you think it's something that's going on and on forever in reality the recycling that we have you're turning that bottle or that piece of PET packaging into a drain pipe or a bus shelter or a carpet something that is can't then be turned into anything else after that so it's not this closed loop system it's it's more like downcycling rather than recycling 
And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions around recycling. What have you done in your own life? Because I heard you mention toothbrush there. We, we now have bamboo toothbrushes. You're never 100% sure when you start making these changes what your, what your impact is, but you hope it's in the right direction. Yeah, so yeah, toothbrushes, obviously a bamboo toothbrush is a really great alternative. Um, or even using um, a toothbrush where you can just switch out the head is a good step because instead of switching out the whole thing, it's just a much smaller piece. Um, I think for me, you know, in my own life, there's there's all of the kind of obvious things that I feel like we hear about every day. There's the coffee cup, the water bottle, having your own cutlery, a reusable bag, using beeswax wrap instead of cling film, all of those sorts of things. It's actually quite easy and fun to eliminate single use plastic from your daily life in that way. Uh, the thing I struggle with the most is food packaging. Um, it's really quite hard, you know, when you're on the go, you're busy, you're constantly shopping in different places because, um, you know, we, we'll travel a lot and trying to, to feed yourself healthy food <laughs> without plastic. It complicates plastic. <laughs> life. This, this is what happens. You start using a refill shop and um, you know, we have food coming from various different sources now because that's a way of getting the packaging down. But then you have to be about five days ahead of yourself instead of just a couple or you know grabbing stuff from the local shop exactly it's the biggest challenge but things are changing you know we now have zero waste shops here in the uk which simply didn't exist five years ago That's what my wife is doing today she's going to the opening of a local shop which is uh, quite interesting because we've been using one that's half an hour away and then you just think well we can only go there a couple of times a year or whatever so yeah it's yeah. happening it is. Um, and, and that's what it's going to take, you know, to get the change and, um, and bring those prices down. So we're heading in the right direction. So what are you doing then on your own personal journey? Because you're very much based at sea, organising people to go out and do research. Absolutely. So X Expedition around the world. Um, this year, we set off for a two year circumnavigation of the planet to do scientific research. And the research is really around trying to pinpoint where the solutions lie. We need to understand of this microplastic soup uh, out there, which is very anonymous. And um, really, where's it coming from? Is it tire dust coming from our cars? Is it polyester microfibers coming from our clothes when we put them in the washing machine is it nurdles the pre-production pellets that haven't even been made into a, a product that's got into the consumer hands yet but it's getting lost in the supply chain uh, there's actually very little we know as to the makeup of that um, quarter of a million tons floating on the surface so that's a big part of what we're trying to find out because we really think it will pinpoint where the opportunities lie on land so there's science but the second of our three aims is storytelling and it's the fact that our ocean covers 70% of the planet and we spend so little time out there getting to know it, understanding the challenges it's facing, um, but also how beautiful and amazing and important the ocean is for our survival and life on land. So there's a lot of uh, important messages that still need to get out to the general public um, from having eyes and access on the ocean. And then the third is all around building this community. Uh, I've certainly realised that um, there's not one way to solve this problem, but that the good news is there are hundreds of things that we can do. And we need different people working from different skill sets and different backgrounds and different countries, all doing their piece in solving the problem. So by taking these 300 women on the boat, it's really helping um, build that army that we need to drive solutions. Is this going the right way at the moment or is the problem just getting bigger? The awareness side of things is definitely going the right, right way. The last couple of years here in the UK have been incredible in seeing the general public consciousness and that's had a massive knock-on effect to industry because companies are really waking up and all wanting to do something about it. Even if they're not sure exactly what they should be doing yet, they certainly desire to do something. And um, The challenge we have now is turning all of that great awareness into action so that the ocean can feel um, the results. Because certainly at the moment, um, across the Pacific, again, last summer, 10 years on from that first time, and, and there was more plastic in, in the Pacific last summer than really actually any of my other expeditions. So that was, you know, a little bit disheartening, um, especially among uh, all of this great energy around the issue. But I don't think it's too late. I think we need to act now, but I do think we can do it. Is there a message for self-builders who are going to 
build their own homes. And I imagine the, the single use plastics are mainly coming from things like packaging. It's so, <laughs> so much packaging. Uh, anything that they can contemplate while they go about their projects? Yeah, I completely agree. Packaging um, is, is just the hardest bit of it. And it, it's tricky because if you are ordering materials um, that you, you're putting on a house that's going to last many decades, um, you don't want them to be damaged because that's even more wasteful. Um, so packaging is important, um, but doing single use packaging, um, you know, that then is just going to get thrown away is not, not clever at all. So I think it's a case of um, working with the companies can you get on the phone to them and try and find a solution um, that maybe they supply significant products to you, you know, things that are coming um, in large orders that might come with large amounts of packaging. Can you work something out where they send it in some kind of reusable, um, you know, whether it's wrapped in blankets or whatever it might be, you know, that you can then return to them? Um, can they come and drop it off and you can carefully be ready to take something out and, and send the rest back? So there is a conversation to be had. And I think a lot of companies are open to it. It saves them money too. If they get to take the packaging home with them and use it for another order that they're taking out, you know, it's much easier than something like Amazon, which is just firing out thousands a day when you come to, um, you know, more significant purchases. Um, on a building and then I think looking at reclaimed there's so much material already out in the world I mean simply when it comes to plastic it's quite horrifying to think that every piece of plastic you've ever used in your entire life still exists on this planet there's so much waste material uh, I appreciate you probably don't want to use waste food packaging on building a house but thinking broadly about the different places that that we can get reclaimed materials um, is key and also just thinking about the site itself you know are there materials already whether it's something old that you're taking down or something that you're modifying and um, where you can really keep as much material on site as possible that so you're not producing waste or importing new things. Now, if we want to take this subject further, either with you go on one of the expeditions or just learn more about what we can be doing in the world of plastic in our own homes and perhaps also on a wider scale to just keep on the backs of politicians, what do you suggest? Um, so certainly following along with Expedition, it's ewexpedition.com um, is the website and the social media. So being part of that movement, absolutely. And um, we've also put together a platform called oceanchangemakers.com, which has got a whole pack of resources really for people to be able to take into their own lives, into their own homes, their own business, um, and really look at what more they can do. So that's packed full of resources um, on there to take things further. Um, but most of all, I would just encourage everybody to ask questions realize that actually lots of other people around them are asking the same questions and have these conversations you know whether it's your supplier who you're working with um, or some sort of waste that you're trying to deal with you know start talking about it because um, there's there's always ways to solve these problems emily thank you very much no problem <laughs> Head online to take a look at the show notes that accompany this session, houseplanninghelp.com slash 272, where you can review the key points. Again, we always provide a summary, a few photos to check out as well, what this soup of plastics is all about, the sailing expeditions as well. Go and have a look. If you've got a comment or you'd like to ask a question, you can do that within the show notes or on social media. So, of course, we'll point you to Emily on Twitter and also the website that she mentioned, emilypen.co.uk houseplanninghelp.com slash 272 with a reminder of all of that. Let's finish on a hub update. This is my membership community that we keep on adding useful resources to. So if you like the podcast, hopefully you'll like the hub. It's more interaction, trying to use multimedia ways of learning as well. And that's where our videos come in handy. I run a production company, so I like to lean on my video skills where we can. So this one's looking at insulating the ground floor on my own house build project, which is over a year ago now, but we're still turning around these videos. We look at the first air tightness test and things are easy to address before you've covered everything up. So that's what it's looking at in this particular episode, what an air tightness test is, how it all works. This is pre plaster on my masonry build. We've got the courses, we've got the live training, the community forum and weekly opportunities to chat through your project with me. That's as part of office hours. Go and take a look what it's all about. Houseplanninghelp.com slash join. Next time, is it possible to build a house without plastic? 
we look at one project that had this on its brief and also it was on a hemp farm so there's a lot of hemp involved if that's perhaps a material you're keen to use then check out our interview with Paloma Gormley from Practice Architecture that is next time thank you so much for listening the House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media content that matters <laughs>